Hello, everybody, and welcome to Sly Can Trust. Today, we are going to talk with Professor Buddhi Marambe about food security and disaster and climate risk management, as well as uh, regenerative agriculture. Uh, professor Buddhi Marambe is a senior professor uh, in weed science uh, attached to the Department of Crop, Crop Science the Faculty of Agriculture, University of Peradeni in Sri Lanka. He is also the president of the Weed Science Society of Sri Lanka. He's a member of the National Experts Committee on Climate Change Adaptation in the Ministry of Environment, as well as um, the editor of the Sri Lanka Journal of Food and Agriculture. That's quite a mouthful, uh, Professor Marambe. We are very, very happy to have you with us today. Um, I won't take uh, too much of your time, and thank you for coming and uh, agreeing to be uh, on this virtual um, uh, interview, which I think is going to be the case for a while at least. Uh, how are you today? Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm doing good. Thank you. How are you? All right. I'm good too. So let's let's start uh, our interview. Um, if you could say, um, um, would you say that uh, Sri Lanka's agricultural sector is rather vulnerable to climate and uh, disaster risks? Uh, and maybe you know, give an example, few examples as well. Yeah. Thank you once again. Thank you, Sly Khan, for bringing me in. I think I have to mention that at the very beginning. Um, let me start with a bit of history, I think. That would be much better to explain matters. Well, we are proud of our hydrological civilization. We talk about our ancient kings. I mean, we still enjoy the luxury of having a lot of reservoirs in Sri Lanka that has supported the agriculture as well as human and animal consumption of water. So a lot of things have been happening over the years, decades, centuries. But the most interesting part is the kings or their advisors in the ancient kingdoms in Sri Lanka must have had some important information. Of course, they must have learned certain things by that time about variability in the climate. That means there are rainfall, there is rainfall uh, at that ample and excessive amounts during certain parts of the year, and there is water shortages in the other parts. So people had this vision looking at the future at that time, centuries ago, to support agriculture, as I told you, human and animal consumption. There has to be some storage, water storage structures to support all these human and animal activities in the country. And I think that is a starting point with all these activities that we talk of, I mean, climate risk, how to face the climate change situations and so on. So people had that vision, people had that idea about what is happening in and around in the environment. People knew agriculture sector is the most vulnerable, I mean, since time immemorial with respect to changes in the rainfall and so on. So I don't think there is a better example to say, to bring in saying that people for a longer period of time in Sri Lanka have had this idea, had the experience, it's scientifically proven now that agriculture sector is the most vulnerable in with respect to climate change as well as the variability. And that's why all these precautions have been taken. That's why all the adaptation techniques have been adopted to make sure we will navigate through scenarios when there is severe climatic extremes and so on that affects our agriculture and so on. If you Take the recent past also. I'm sure everybody is very, very aware, well aware about this German watch who has been talking about climate risk. I mean, there are a lot of half who going on saying that Sri Lanka is number two in terms of vulnerability about two to three years ago. But you see, that uh, German watch is it's doing a pretty good job, I must tell you, in a, in, a, in a situation where we don't have a foolproof system. They have at least come up with certain indicators so that our, our, uh, there, there can be a certain level of indication given to the general public as well as to the governments saying that, okay, this is the level of your vulnerability, for example. Now, this is an annual thing, I must tell you, at this particular say We don't need to... Take, take it we have to take it seriously but not to say whenever the time we have been ranked at a given position that is going to be forever i just took this example i thought this is the best time to explain this because your question is related to climate risk my example for having reservoirs and so on is the adaptation technology and just to let you know that people since time immemorial knew what to be done and new th things are happening give me about 30 seconds to let this i mean let this component 
phone and uh, uh, so, I mean spitting out from me, right? <laughs> the the in in 2015 we have one of the best years in this country with respect to agriculture and the, the highest ever recorded yield at that time was recorded in 2015 in the case of rice and many other crops that's because of a favorable climate and the german watch at that time ranks sri lanka at number 98 that means we are well off in terms of climate risk so because we had a very favorable climate and one of the few indicators that they use are mainly the deaths because of severe or because of climate extremes loss of life and so on because in 2015 we did not experience those but in 2016 and 2017 we had disastrous two years in the recent past in 2016 we have but i think we all know that we lost about 96 lives 93 lives altogether in samasara landslide in Maunella. so all those things accounted sri lanka to be listed at highly climate vulnerable country or a country that is very high in terms of climate risk position in Sri Lanka at number two. But in 2017, we have bounced back, I must tell you. I mean, thanks to climate again, we have bounced back to number six. And Japan is number one, for example. So my, my point is this climate risk scenario depends on how we, how we prepare, how well prepared we are as a country. And of course, certain things, even if we are well prepared, depending on the level, the level of the climate ex extremes that we experience, things can go wrong. So coming, coming back to your original question, is agriculture vulnerable? Yes. The, the most highly vulnerable segment in our economy, I must tell you, because agriculture is interwoven into our culture. We should not forget about that. So it's a kind of a holistic thing that is being affected by the climate. Uh, is there's climate risk felt? Yes, that has been there since time immemorial, as I told you. So it's really how, so we, really how, we, how, look, how we look at it look and, at how, it we and how we adapt. Exactly. Um, and I think that is also very important in terms of uh, the government and our policies. So if I may ask you, uh, how are climate disaster risks currently addressed in Sri Lanka as far as, in, especially in the food sector, how, yeah. um, how far is it addressed in terms of policy making? Yeah, that's a, that's a very pertinent question, I must tell you. Well, uh, very few people know, very unfortunately, that there's a national climate change policy in Sri Lanka, which was adopted in 2012. And it addresses both adaptation and mitigation components with respect to climate change. So that's one thing I must tell you. And of course, there, there are disaster risk management strategies that have been developed in this country. Going further, when you look at the agriculture sector, for example, very recently, just end of last year, we developed the a draft of overarching agriculture policy which covers about eight main areas that comes under the main umbrella of agriculture that includes environment as well so naturally the climate change component comes in so in, but that policy has to be approved by the cabinet of ministers is still to go through that process but it's gone through a wider stakeholder consultation i must tell you so it's a fairly comprehensive one that is there which has been prepared by the the national planning department i must tell you for the first time probably in the history the department of national planning came forward and started developing a very comprehensive policy of this nature so all all hats off for them if for doing that but still there are a lot of things to be done and on top of that again you have to remember having a policy alone will not help unless we have proper strategies and proper action plans to make sure that we are through with the system. And the Sri Lankan government, as well as the Ministry of Environment, I have to tell you, have taken, have taken a lot of steps forward after adopting this national climate change policy in 2012. In 2016, we have already done our national adaptation plan. It's been done at the national level, and now the Ministry of Environment is in the process of developing this at the, at the provincial level. In other words, provincial adaptation plans, we all know that that, the, if, that everything, any work that will take on, on the ground activities will have to be done 
with the support of the provincial governments and the local governments. So it's a very good move taken by the Ministry of Environment also to move ahead, getting these provincial adaptation plans done. And by going by the, the UNFCCC conditions, especially uh, with respect to Paris Agreement, Sri Lanka has also prepared its national nationally determined contributions. That was also released in 2016. We have, we have made certain commitments in different segments, but I must tell you, agriculture was not a priority segment that was considered when the NDC, NDCs were prepared, but NDCs are now being modified or updated, I must tell you. And there, at this particular moment, uh, the stakeholders have decided, no, agriculture is a very important component uh, with respect to country's economy, as well as a component that will contribute to greenhouse gas emissions as well. In other words, there's some contribution towards climate change. So as good global citizens, what we have to do is do our agriculture using best possible technology, making sure the productivity improves while ensuring the damage to the environment whatsoever is going to be minimum. So a line of thinking has changed over the years. So the answer to your question, once again, there is a national climate change policy. There is overarching agriculture policy as well, still at the draft states. We have developed all the national adaptation plans. We are on the move in developing the provincial adaptation plans. The nationally determined contributions have been done. It's updated right now with having the agriculture components inbuilt. So that so is the way we move towards. Oh, so, sorry, sorry, and that's, that's and wonderful that's because wonderful. the agencies will give us that direction in terms of the right direction, so to speak. Exactly. So um, uh, that's, I think, uh, very good to know in terms of Sri Lanka and how we move forward. So uh, as you said, the ground level uh, work needs to be done, needs to be implemented. Um, I'm sure there are uh, certain challenges when you address that as well. Uh, and in terms of you know building a building resilience in the agricultural sector, yeah. so if that is the case, um, how can you overcome them in terms of ground level? Because the NDCs are obviously the guiding force, but how do we take it to the ground level? And what challenges are there really when you uh, when you implement these? Yeah, yeah, that, that's once again a very good question. It is easier said than done. Um, we have to we have to understand that aspect. All these documentation they can come on paper very nicely. But when it starts getting implemented only, we'll start feeling the pressure. Um, I mean, the, goose, the best example that I can bring in is about the national policies in Sri Lanka. You name it, we have it. There are more than 100 policies, for example, but the issues have always arisen from the time that we start implementing them on the ground. So that is why I think even when we develop the overarching agriculture policy, the first consultation took place at the provincial government levels, at the provincial setup, getting provincial departments on board because they feel the pulse of the ground level personalities in this country. And that is true for agriculture as well. So my, my, my point here is that we do, we are in the process right now to develop the provincial adaptation plans, true. But then we are need to be a lot of capacity building uh, especially in terms of awareness creation at the ground level people, at the local government level to get them on board as a team. Because this is not the time to argue and see whether climate change is happening or not. It is happening. It's a fact and it's not a myth. I don't think we have time to argue and waste time on that. So the important thing is get this message across to people at the ground level. They do understand that a lot of work being done at the ground level to see about the perceptions of the farming community of a climate change. They are very well aware. They are aware about it much more than us scientists to tell you the truth. But they getting everybody together, the, the, the inter-institutional coordination coming in, more importantly, the community coming in, community getting the taking the leadership and the government, the state sector, getting ready to palm down the responsibility as well. This, this is a shared responsibility. All in all, government alone can do it, people alone can do it. People, I mean, people can say government is people, but then still there are different levels that we work out. What, what is important is, as I told you, people have to work together. The central government, provincial government, local governments and the people at ground level. They do understand what's going on. 
but then the technological support, the know-how support has to be given. So it's a continuing process. We should not do one seminar, one lecture, one webinar and tell well everything is done. It's like we are we are talking in terms of professional, we are talking about continuing professional development. Same thing applies here. For people, there should be continuous education, continuous awareness, because climate change is not the only thing that is in their mind always. No, there are 101 things that people will have to, will have to think of and to get this climate change concerns into their day-to-day -day business. It is the, the, the way out, but it is an Herculean task. And that is something that we have to embark on collectively. People in the government, universities, organizations like SLIKE and all those people will have to come together in doing this part of the work. Yeah. And then um, in terms of now we are talking about resilient agriculture uh, so that we can, we can face what is out there in the future, in the present, at any point. Um, yes. So um, do we, uh, are regenerative agricultural systems common in Sri Lanka? Um, what what is your view on that? Yeah, that's the same important question once again. When you talk of regenerative agriculture, we are I mean there there are a lot of things that come into picture. But putting a, putting everything in nature, we are trying to look at the soil health while yes. minimizing the impacts of climate change. So I think those two things are the best way that I can explain about regenerative agriculture. I mean, go back in the history, people are still very proud and take pride on talking about the agriculture systems that we had in the past people sometimes even people romanticize the whole thing beyond extents that we can imagine that's not to be done in all these efforts but regenerative agriculture makes sure that the soil properties are improved because we know soil health is wealth we should never forget that. Once you establish the soil health, you enhance the soil health, making sure the micro microorganisms or the microflora community in the soil will do their part of the job with the assistance of human beings who are in agriculture. Now, now, now do remember, we should never forget, we are the people who enter a natural ecosystem and convert it to an agriculture ecosystem. Now, once this is done, it's an irreversible reaction. There's no way of going back. What we try to do, the attempts that we made are to make sure at least we try to get close, uh, closer to this, to that natural ecosystem, which we cannot reach. I mean, that, that, that's a fact as well. But in, in this process, if the damage that we have done at the initial stage by breaking the equilibrium that was there in the natural ecosystem, try to make sure the microflora, microfauna, everything together will start working towards developing the soil fertility, whereas the human interventions coming up by having crop rotation, having organic matter build up with different technologies that there are, and that will be, I'm not telling that is the only way out, that will be one of the best ways out of this whole system, whole problems that we are facing right now. But I'm not making, br blaming something called conventional agriculture. I mean, you take the green revolution, it has, it has done its part. I mean, we have to be thankful that we have food to eat, food to consume, it has been produced. But, but let's look at the environmental concerns right now. Regenerative agriculture comes in, plowing things back to the system rather than removing everything out of it. Now, unlike in the in the natural ecosystem, where everything is recycled, you need not worry much about the whole thing, isn't it? Because we do not take out take things out from a natural ecosystem, damage in the system. But in agricultural ecosystem, one thing that we should never forget, we always harvest. Yield is taken out of the system. Every time the yield is taken now, you are removing enormous amount of nutrients from the system. It means you are removing the most fertile part of the soil. Don't forget that. The fertility is taken out. So that fertility levels will have to be replenished if the ecosystem to be conserved as well as the agriculture to be sustainable. So this is where all these novel technologies plus the time-proven traditional technologies collectively will play an important role. So that is so an very important aspect for future. That's right. So it's actually a very um, sustainable way of giving and taking 
so that we just don't take and uh, obviously be a uh, part of the balance, make sure that the balance is not really overturned in any possible way. Um, uh, are there any uh, success stories in terms of uh, resilient and regenerative agriculture in Sri Lanka in terms of um, like crops and things that you could think of that really works for Sri Lanka or has worked in Sri Lanka? Yes, of course. Now, let me, I mean, without going into the history, let me talk about yes. what has been happening in the recent past. Okay, when I ask this history, of course, yeah. Now, take take the Department of Agriculture. I mean, I must say a lot of people blame Department of Agriculture, but I will give all due credit for them, for all the hard work that they have done to uplift the agriculture sector in Sri Lanka. But leave it aside for the moment. Now, about, about, about a decade ago, sometime, I think it's about two decades ago, the Department of Agriculture started talking about integrated plant nutrient systems, IPNS, and also talking about crop rotation, mixed cropping, rather than going through soil cropping. So, and, and bringing crop animals together, crop animal integration, we call it crop livestock integration in most of the cases. All those things are actually part and parcel of regenerative agriculture. Now, what does this integrated plant nutrient systems mean? We usually use mineral fertilizer, and that has, that's, that's something that we have been used for. Now, if, if you do a real calculation, I mean, assume a situation that we harvest one ton of rice per hectare, we are removing 21 kilograms of nitrogen. I'm not going to talk about the phosphorus and potassiums right now, just to give an example. So say average, we get about five tons per hectare. It's not the national average, but in many parts of the dry zone, you get about five tons per hectare. That's easily 100, 100 bushels per acre. When that is done, 105 kilograms of nitrogen being removed. And we cultivate paddy two seasons a year. Now just imagine the amount of nitrogen that will be removed from the system purely to fulfill our food needs, isn't it? Now, these nutrients will have to come back. And because the nutrient supplement has to be done quickly and people always love to see plants growing quickly with supplement of nutrients, people we have been used to using uh, mineral fertilizers. But mineral fertilizers, the problem is, I'm again taking nitrogen as an example, because it's the most difficult nutrient to handle in the system. It's a different subject, so I'm not going to talk about it much. And a lot of nitrogen that we apply get lost in the system. We usually say the nitrogen use efficiency is about 25 to 30 percent. That means about 70 percent of the nitrogen that we use get lost. So suppose there's a mechanism, these losses are minimized. And that we apply, uh, we apply sources of nutrient, whatever the source is, that will gradually release the required nutrient so that plant can uptake at the crucial time periods or critical time periods of its growth in adequate quantities. That would have been the ideal situation. It does not happen in reality, this situation. Now take you and me, during our younger days, our parents fed us well. They gave us the adequate amount of nutrients or the required nutrients at the correct time. And the, the nutritional balance in our diet was taken care of, isn't it? Otherwise, both of us will never be here at this particular moment. Now, the same thing applies for a plant. It's a living being. So unless these nutrients are supplied in an integrated manner, mineral supply can work well. But then the organic matter will come in, has to come into, few, uh, come into the picture to make sure the nutrient losses are minimized so that the nutrients can get absorbed to the system and get released gradually where the plant can absorb it as I told you a little while ago at its critical period of growth. So this is one of the best examples that I can I can bring you. So mineral fertilizer is always been advisable to use in conjunction with organic fertilizer. Now, remember, it came long time ago, though people don't use it. Now, take this, take the second component I was talking about. We, we cultivate two seasons, as I told you. Now, the Department of Agriculture, some farmers also were practicing it for a long period of time, introduced a mid-season. Between the two main seasons, to make maximum use that limited time period and with residual moisture, they are advocating to cultivate a short duration crops like moonbean, for example. 
leguminous crop that can fix atmospheric nitrogen. No additional moisture requirements, fertilizer are needed. Whatever the residual moisture will be utilized, the plant will fix atmospheric nitrogen and also give the farming community a new nutritious food, a pulse, a mumbi. And this crop rotation system will assist the survival of the rice, legume, rice crop rotation. Is it it? So that's as a package, that's a very good income earner for, for farming, farming community and also providing nutritious food to the society. I think these two are the best examples, not coming out of the blue, coming because there are research results, scientists have contributed to that and farmers have taken it up as a good adaptation strategy as well. It supports their economy, it supports their food security and nutrition security, and also definitely it will provide sustainable agriculture and it, is, it contributes to sustainable agriculture in the system. Thank you. And then um, perhaps just to uh, just to talk and give me your opinion as well in terms of uh, how can we provide our farmers with sort of better access to market information because there is we have to match the demand with the supply and most of our prevent wastage because we have a lot of agricultural wastage as well in yeah. many elements and many levels. Um, yes. What what are your thoughts on this in terms of providing the information that the farmers require, not just really market information, even in terms of climate risks and all of that. How yes. do we get there? Yeah. Yes, yes. This has been a long debated thing and we have failed miserably in many of those cases. And I am also part and parcel of that. I'm also to be blamed. We, we, I mean, teaching, preaching alone is not going to do I mean, the whole thing unless we get into action. And Department of Agriculture and many line departments have done their best also in the past, but more to be done, I must tell you. And once again, this is an effort where everybody has to get on board together. Let me give you some examples. You're quite right. Information is power. Knowledge is power. So it's information is power that we have to understand. When the farmers are given the correct information in an understandable language, in an accessible form, and that is the best thing that you can arm them to make sure make sure that they will make their own decision, prudent decisions. A lot of good things have happened in the past. I mean, to take, take thanks to COVID, how many, how many uh, ICT technology, ICT things that came into effect People start using ICT in agriculture. It, it has been there for a longer period of time. Mind you, we had an e-agriculture strategy in this country from 2016 to 2020. Although certain parts work well, certain parts not. And we are now trying to see how we can extend the agriculture strategy for future to support agriculture. It's all about information. We don't have a national database on agriculture. And mind you, we are in a country. We calculate the paddy harvest very well but we do not know where that paddy is stored. We do not know where that paddy is stored. I mean, that, that's a very unfortunate scenario. You, you can point the fingers to different people, but then there's no answer to that. Now, finally, it may end up with farmers say, I mean, we, we, we never know. We never know who stored this paddy. I mean, the extents are clear, the harvest is clear, average yield is clear, but only thing that we do not know is where has this paddy gone. And that is because we don't have a very good national database. I think it's high time. I know Ministry of Agriculture, with the support of the present secretary and so on, they are developing this national database. They are collecting lots of, uh, I mean, there are a wealth of information that has been collected right now. Only after that, farmers can be given the correct message. So that is one thing with respect to the demand and supply, isn't it? Once this database... Easy. But there's another thing as well. I must tell you, since our, our 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 discussion was focusing on climate change from very beginning, there are climate advisories given by the Department of Agriculture before starting of every season. The Natural Resource Management Center, under the current leadership of Dr. Ranjit Punnevardhana, they releases the advisory climate advisories now the, there are different pathways of these climate advisories reaching the farm i mean if it's go and reach the provincial department of agriculture or district uh, secretariat of agriculture if it doesn't move further from that point onwards unless it reach the inducer 
then of course I, I mean I, I'm not saying it's a useless exercise but the real expected outcome and output is not there so this is something that we have to we have to think of we can have all the databases we can have all the necessary information unless we find the most prudent most effective pathway to get that message across in an understandable language to the farming community we will still fail even after having a database so I think we have to start thinking thinking on these lines i will i will bring in a bring in another example which is not directly related to that but of course since you spoke of this post harvest things also it matches well now now look at the post harvest losses that we are talking about i mean there are different values given by different people forget about we forget about that we know the perishables they are there is always high risk in losses now every time when the fruit and vegetable uh, yield or harvests are high, we start talking about value action, isn't it? Our, our fruits and vegetables are seasonal. Our discussion on value addition is also seasonal, unfortunately. So, I mean, unless we start planning from square one, I mean, we do cultivation planning very well, I must tell you. Department of Agriculture has very good forecasts been done, disseminated from different sources, whether the farmer gets set or not is a different issue. But then Department of Agriculture has also now developed a mobile-based crop forecasting system for vegetables especially. So every month on sixth day and the 21st day, this has this been updated for the next 14 days to let well, no. Take 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 beans for example. How many acres of beans should be cultivated right now within next two weeks in order to get X amount of harvest and Y amount of price? So I mean that information is available in in single and Tamil medium. So it is more more accessible and more understandable. But my point is that as we plan for cultivation, we also plan for valuation from the beginning. Then and only then this this continuum will be there. No point blaming farmers, no point blaming scientists. At the end, when the, when the pumpkin harvest is there, and when you start giving, and when you start, when you try to start addressing that problem at that, that particular point, things will never work. And the farming community also knows when the pumpkin uh, uh, yields are high, when they cannot sell this, government will intervene somehow or other and they will be remunerated as well. So let's get this line together, match well, get all these bits and pieces of this chain link connected very well. Start from planning and make sure there's value addition well planned. So all these things require information. Without that information reaching the farmer, nothing will move forward. I think we are in the correct direction. And it's not happening right now. This is due to a long-term process. I see there is a culmination very soon. So let's hope for the best. Yes, and I think that is uh, uh, quite wonderful because what I feel from our discussion as well, it's just not because everything is in place. It's just that you need to have that amalgamation. Uh, uh, the right sort of attitude and yeah. uh, sort of a, a, a vision for the future as to what you want so that yeah. uh, I think everyone needs to be prudent in their decisions and understand what needs to be done you know so it's like a, a ground level up and top to bottom level of uh, attitude and change and uh, which which is very vital and I think uh, this is the period of time that we can really plan things out and uh, look at ourselves and introspect and then move forward as well. Uh, finally, to wrap things up, would you like to add anything uh, to our discussion, some uh, personal opinions or views, something that I might not have asked you and you would like to add as well? Let me give a message in this case, whether we are talking about climate, agriculture or whatever. Don't blame the past. Let's assume that we have taken decisions, the decisions that we have taken in the past are the best possible decisions based on the circumstances at that time. So let's start building upon that. Why I'm telling is that now since 1989, we have been blaming the government of Sri Lanka saying that we have dismantled the extension system. It's 30 years now. 30 years we have been blaming the past. So let's try to develop a new system together. So that's, that's just an example. So the important thing is, let's change our line of thinking people talk of paradigm shifts that's fine whatever the shift that we want to make let's do it with a cause with a vision as you quite correctly said at least we have 2030 in front of us sdg goals the goals that we have to achieve by 2030 let's 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 have and have an eye on that and work towards it achieve it 
and only we that we can do it working collectively. That's the message. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Marambi. It was a very wonderful conversation that I had with you. And I'm sure all our viewers will also find a lot of uh, positive thoughts on it, and uh, will, which will help them also to change their attitudes and uh, move forward as we should. Um, so stay safe and all the best to you. Uh, we are looking forward to working with you in the future as well. So um, keep in touch and stay safe. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you.